The subcommittee will come to order without objection. The chair may declare a recess at any time. Before we get started, I want to recognize a moment of silence for the victims of the white supremacist hate crime in Buffalo, New York. The subcommittee has focused intently on that threat in both open and closed hearings. It is utterly devastating to see more victims of this violence. Buffalo, our heart breaks for you. With that, I ask my colleagues to join, oh, pardon me, we will now turn to the business of this hearing. More than 50 years ago, the U.S. government ended Project Blue Book, an effort to catalog and understand sightings of objects in the air that could not otherwise be explained. For more than 20 years, that project had treated unidentified anomalies in our airspace as a national security threat to be monitored and investigated. In 2017, we learned for the first time that the Department of Defense had quietly restarted a similar organization tracking what we now call unidentified aerial phenomena, or UAPs. Last year, Congress re rewrote the charter for that organization, now called the Airborne Object Identification and Management Synchronization Group, or AIM. SOG. For short, today we will bring that organization out of the shadows. This hearing and oversight work has a simple idea at its core. Unidentified aerial phenomena are a potential national security threat, and they need to be treated that way. For too long, the stigma associated with UAPs has gotten in the way of good intelligence analysis. Pilots avoided reporting or were laughed at when they did. DOD officials relegated the issue to the back room or swept it under the rug entirely, fearful of a skeptical national security community. Today, we know better. UAPs are unexplained, it's true, but they are real. They need to be investigated, and many threats they pose need to be mitigated. Under Secretary Moultrie, Mr. Bray, thank you for coming today. Um, first, we need you to update us on the status of AIMSOC. The legislation creating it was passed in December. The deadline for implementation is fast approaching. But the group does not even have a named director. We need to know, sirs, the status of the organization and the obstacle to getting it up and running. Secondly, you have to convince the audience today, and most especially our military and civilian aviators, the culture has changed that those who report UAPs will be treated as witnesses, not as kooks. Thirdly, you need to show us, Congress, and the American public, whose imaginations you have captured. You are willing to follow the facts where they lead. You know, we fear sometimes that the DOD is focused more on emphasizing what it can explain, not investigating what it can't. I'm looking for you to assure us today that all conclusions are on the table. One final note, we are mindful today that AIMSOG is not starting from scratch. This is the third version of this task force in DOD and civil society groups like the Mutual UFO Network, uh, Mr. Corbell and others have been collecting data on this issue for years. I hope you'll explain how you can leverage the knowledge and experience of our prior work on this matter to move the AIMSOG along. The last time Congress had a hearing on UAPs was half a century ago. I hope that it does not take 50 more years for Congress to hold another because transparency is desperately needed. I now turn to Ranking Member Crawford for comments he'd like to make. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Honorable Moultrie, Mr. Bray, thank you for coming here today. We appreciate it uh, to begin the open dialogue between Congress and the executive branch on this important topic. While this topic evokes creative imaginations of many, aside from all the hype and speculation, there are important underlying issues posed by UAPs. Despite the serious nature of this topic, I have to say I'm more interested in our understanding of Chinese and Russian hypersonic weapon development or understanding why this administration was so slow to share actionable intelligence with the Ukrainians. However, in as much as this topic may help us better understand unknown activities of Russia and China, I am on board. The intelligence community has a serious duty to our taxpayers to prevent potential adversaries such as China and Russia from surprising us with unforeseen new technologies. 
As overseers of the intelligence community, this committee has an obligation to understand what you are doing to determine whether any UAPs are new technologies or not. And if they are, where are they coming from? In general, the IC spends much of its time and resources trying to understand what we call known unknowns. When it comes to foreign nations' weapons systems and sensors, known unknowns are those features that we don't fully understand yet. The challenge associated with UAP is that they are completely unknown and require a more expansive collection and analysis effort. The intelligence community must balance addressing known threats to our nation, national security with preventing technical surprise. We must continue to follow the facts where they lead us and ensure that there are no technical surprises. The IC must take it seriously when there are credible observations of phenomena that seem to perform in ways that could pose a threat to safe flight operations or that could be signs of a foreign adversary's attempt to develop a strategic technological surprise against the United States. It's also essential that our pilots and others feel they can report UAPs they observe without any stigma for doing so. This is the open, unclassified portion of our hearing. We'll have a closed, classified part later. It's important for the public to know that the classification of information exists to protect national security, not to try to hide the truth. When we're trying to determine if any UAPs are new technologies being developed by foreign governments, we are inevitably going to run into classified information about what new systems and technologies we do know are in the works here or abroad. But where information does not risk national security, it should be shared with our allies and the public when feasible. I hope that we can have your assurance to this end today. It's my hope that the intelligence community will continue to try to determine the nature of UAPs we've observed and will keep Congress fully apprised of all developments. I look forward to this hearing and continued dialogue and oversight with the intelligence community on this topic. And with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back, and now I will turn to our distinguished chairman, Adam Schiff, for any comments he wishes to make. Thank you, Chairman Carson, uh, for holding this open hearing on unidentified aerial phenomenon and for your leadership on this issue. Holding a portion of our discussion today in open session is critical to the cause of transparency and openness, which was Congress's intent in authorizing and funding this new task force. The larger effort that is being undertaken to study and characterize UAP reports is an important step towards understanding these phenomenon, what we know and don't know. And I look forward to hearing more during both the open session and the closed setting about how DOD and the IC are undertaking that task. UAP reports have been around for decades, and yet we haven't had an orderly way for them to be reported without stigma and to be investigated. That needs to change. UAP reports need to be understood as a national security matter, and that message needs to go out across DOD, the IC, and the whole of the U.S. government. When we spot something we don't understand or can't identify in our airspace, it's the job of those we entrust with our national security to investigate and to report back. That is why it's important that we hold this open hearing for the public to hear directly from the Department of Defense on the steps it's taking to track analyze and transparently communicate the work that is being done on this issue. It is also the responsibility of our government and this panel to share as much as we can with the American people, since excessive secrecy only breeds distrust and speculation. I look forward to hearing how the UAP task force is being stood up, what challenges they still face, and how this committee can make sure the task force is able to shed light on one of the world's most enduring mysteries. Uh, I thank uh, you gentlemen for your work and uh, be very interested to hear what you have to say. Uh, to me, among the most fascinating questions uh, are these uh, phenomena that we can measure, that is uh, instruments report there is something there. It is not the human eye confusing objects in the sky. Uh, there is something there measurable by multiple instruments and yet it seems to move in directions that are inconsistent with what we know of physics or science uh, more broadly. And uh, that to me poses uh, questions of, of tremendous interest and uh, as well as potential national security significance. So we look forward to hearing what you're able to report to us today in open session. And I want to thank uh, Chairman Carson again for his extraordinary leadership on this issue. And I yield back. Chairman yields back. Thank you. With that, we will start our hearing. Under Secretary Moultrie, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Chairman Schiff, uh, Committee Chairman Carson, Ranking Member Crawford, distinguished members of the subcommittee, it's a privilege to be here with you today to address your questions regarding Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon, or UAP. I'm pleased to be joined by Mr. Scott Bray, the Deputy Director of Naval Intelligence, who will speak to the Navy's Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon Task Force, which laid the foundation for the efforts we will discuss today. 
First, I'd like to thank Congress for supporting the department's UAP efforts. The NDAA for fiscal year 2022 has helped us to establish a dedicated office to oversee processes and procedures for the timely collection, processing, analysis, and reporting of UAP-related data. What are UAP? Put simply, UAP are airborne objects that, when encountered, cannot be immediately identified. However, it is the department's contention that by combining appropriately structured collected data with rigorous scientific analysis, any object that we encounter can likely be isolated, characterized, identified, and if necessary, mitigated. We know that our service members have encountered unidentified aerial phenomena, and because UAPs pose potential flight safety and general security risk, we are committed to a focused effort to determine their origins. Our effort will include the thorough examination of adversarial platforms and potential breakthrough technologies, U.S. government or commercial platforms, allied or partner systems, and other natural phenomena. We also understand that there has been a cultural stigma surrounding UAP. Our goal is to eliminate the stigma by fully incorporating our operators and mission personnel into a standardized data gathering process. We believe that making UAP reporting a mission imperative will be instrumental to the effort's success. The Defense Intelligence and Security Enterprise provides real-time support to our warfighters and mission personnel across all domains. To optimize the department's UAP work, we are establishing an office within the Office of the Secretary of Defense. That office's function is clear, to facilitate the identification of previously unknown or unidentified airborne objects in a methodical, logical, and standardized manner. These goals will ensure that we are working closely with operational personnel on training and reporting requirements, developing data and intelligence requirements, standardizing and integrating processes and procedures for collection, operational surveillance, analysis, and reporting, leveraging our research and development capabilities to improve detection, characterization, and identification of UAPs, developing mitigating solutions and procedures, and identifying strategy and policy solutions. This effort will maximize collaboration and build upon already existing relationships with the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, the FAA, DHS, and the FBI. We are also committed to strong partnerships with the Department of Energy, NOAA, the DEA, NASA, and the National Labs, and just as importantly, our international partners and allies. With regard to the importance of transparency, the Department is fully committed to the principle of openness and accountability to the American people. However, we are also mindful of our obligation to protect sensitive sources and methods. Our goal is to strike that delicate balance, one that enables us to maintain the public's trust while preserving those capabilities that are vital to the support of our service personnel. In closing, the department is committed to this effort and welcomes the challenge. We thank you for your committed support and look forward to your questions. Chairman Schiff, Chairman Carson, Ranking Member Crawford, and committee members, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today to highlight the ongoing work of the Department of Defense uh, regarding unidentified aerial phenomena. Since the early 2000s, uh, we have seen an increasing number of unauthorized and or unidentified aircraft or objects in military controlled training areas uh, and training ranges and other designated airspace. Reports of sightings are frequent and continuing. We attribute this increase in reporting to a number of factors, including our work to destigmatize reporting, an increase in the number of new systems such as quadcopters and unmanned aerial systems that are in our airspace, uh, identification of what we can classify as clutter, mylar balloons and other types of, uh, of air trash, and improvements in the capabilities of our various sensors to detect things in our airspace. Almost two years ago in August of 2020, Deputy Secretary of Defense Nordquist directed the establishment of the Unidentified Aerial Phenomena Task Force within the Department uh, of the Navy. The UAP Task Force was built on the foundation of the Navy's initial efforts to respond to the reports from our aviators on unidentified objects observed in our training ranges. The basic issues then and now are twofold. First, 
Incursions in our training ranges by unidentified objects represent serious hazards to safety of flight. In every aspect of naval aviation, safety of our air crews is paramount. Second, intrusions by unknown aircraft or objects pose potential threats to the security of our operations. Our aviators train as they would fight. So any intrusions that may compromise the security of our operations by revealing our capabilities, our tactics, techniques, or procedures uh, are of great concern uh, to the Navy and the Department of Defense. From the very beginning, we took these reports very seriously. We instituted a data-driven approach to the investigations where we could collect as much data as possible and use all available resources to analyze and make informed decisions on the best ways to address our findings. Our main objective was to transition UAP efforts from an anecdotal or narrative-based uh, approach to a rigorous science and technology engineering-focused study. This data-driven approach uh, requires input from a wide variety of sources. Uh, in the early stages, uh, the task force worked to standardize the reporting mechanisms and processes to make it as easy as possible uh, for personnel to report any engagement so that we were getting that wide range of reporting that we needed. We also spent considerable efforts engaging directly with our naval aviators and building relationships to help destigmatize the act of reporting sightings or encounters. And we worked with naval aviation leadership to provide additional equipment to record any encounter. Navy and Air Force uh, crews now have step-by-step -step procedures for reporting on a UAP on their kneeboard uh, in, their, uh, in the cockpit and uh, in their post-flight uh, debrief procedures. The direct result of those efforts has been increased reporting with increased opportunities to focus a number of sensors on any objects. The message is now clear. If you see something, you need to report it. And the message has been received. In fact, recently, I received a call from a senior naval aviator with over 2,000 flight hours. He called me personally from the flight line uh, after landing uh, to talk about uh, an encounter that he had just experienced. Those were just the initial steps. We also made a concerted effort to assemble subject matter experts from across the Department of Defense and the intelligence community and other U.S. government agencies and departments. We forged partnerships with the research development and acquisition communities, with industry partners, and with academic research labs, and we brought many allies and international partners into our discussions on UAP. Additionally, subject matter experts from a wide variety uh, of fields, including physics, optics, metallurgy, meteorology, uh, just to name a few, have been brought in to, uh, uh, to expand our understanding in areas where meet, we may not have organic expertise. In short, we've endeavored to bring an all-hands-on-deck approach uh, to, the, to better understand this phenomena. So what have we learned so far? Any given observation may be fleeting or longer. It may be recorded or not. It may be observable by one or multiple assets. In short, there's rarely an easy answer. For example, let me share with you the first video that we have here today, which shows an observation in real time. There it was. That's, in many cases, that's all that a report may include. And in many other cases, we have far less than this. As we detailed in both the unclassified and classified versions of the preliminary assessment released by the Office of the Director of National Intelligence last June, this often limited amount of high quality data uh, and reporting hampers our ability to draw firm conclusions about the nature or intent of UAP. As detailed in the ODNI report, if and when individual UAP incidents are resolved, they likely fall into one of five potential explanatory categories. Airborne clutter, natural atmospheric phenomena, U.S. government or U.S. industry developmental programs, foreign adversary systems, or a other bin that allows for a holding bin of difficult cases and for the possibility of surprise and potential scientific discovery. We stand by those initial results. Since the release of that preliminary report, the UAP Task Force uh, database has now grown to contain approximately 400 reports. The stigma has been reduced. We've also made progress in resolving the character of a limited number of UAP encounters. For example, let me show you a couple of uh, another video and image uh, taken years apart in different areas. In this video, U.S. Navy personnel recorded what appears to be triangles, some flashing, recorded several years ago off the coast of the United States. 
This was recorded while the U.S. Navy ship uh, observed a number of small unmanned aerial systems uh, in the area. And importantly, the video was taken through night vision goggles with a single lens reflex camera. These remained unresolved for several years. Several years later, and off a different coast, U.S. Navy personnel, again, in a swarm of unmanned aerial systems, and again through night vision goggles and an SLR camera, uh, recorded this image. But this time, other U.S. Navy assets also observed unmanned aerial systems nearby. And we're now reasonably confident that these triangles correlate to unmanned aerial systems in the area. The triangular appearance is a result of light passing through the night vision goggles and then being recorded by an SLR camera. Now, I don't mean to suggest that everything that we observe uh, is, uh, is identifiable, but, um, the, um, uh, it, but this is a great example of how it takes considerable effort to understand what we're seeing uh, in the examples that we are able to collect. Um, in this example, we accumulated sufficient data from two similar encounters from two different time periods in two different geographic areas uh, to help us draw the, these conclusions. That's not always the case, though. We recognize that that can be unsatisfying or insufficient in the eyes of many. This is a popular topic uh, in our nation with various theories as to what these objects may be and where they originate. By nature, we are all curious and we seek to understand the unknown. And as a lifelong intelligence professional, I'm impatient. I want immediate explanations for this as much as anyone else. However, understanding can take significant time and effort. It's why we've endeavored to concentrate on this data-driven process to drive fact-based results. And given the nature of our business, national defense, we've had to sometimes be less forthcoming with information in open forums than many would hope. If UAP do indeed represent a potential threat to our security, then the capabilities, systems, processes, and sources we use to observe, record, study, or analyze these phenomena need to be classified at appropriate levels. We do not want, we do not want potential adversaries to know exactly what we're able to see or understand or how we come to the conclusions we make. Therefore, public dis disclosures must be carefully considered on a case-by-case -case basis. So what's next? We're concentrating on a seamless transition to the new organization. And future analysis of complicated uh, issues of uh, UAP issues will greatly benefit from the infrastructure of the process and the procedures that we've developed to date. I'm confident that the task force under Navy leadership has forged a path forward that will allow us to anchor assessments in science and engineering via anecdotal evidence. We remain committed to that goal, as I know the USDI uh, uh, organization does as well. So thank you very much for your interest uh, and continuing support for the UAP Task Force. The team's made a lot of progress, but we really are just establishing the foundation uh, for the more detailed analysis that's yet to be done. And with your continued support, we can sustain that momentum necessary to produce data-centric analysis and understanding the phenomena. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bray. Uh, this is the third version of this task force. And to be frank, um, one of Congress's concerns is that the executive branch in administration, both parties, uh, has been sweeping concerns about UAPs under the rug by focusing on events that can be explained and avoiding events that cannot be explained. What can you, what, 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 what can you say to give the American people confidence that you aren't just focusing our attention on low-hanging fruit with easy explanations? Congressman, I'll start, and then uh, Mr. Bray, um, please feel free to uh, to weigh in. So the way that we're approaching this is with a, a more thorough, standardized methodology than what we have in the past. First and foremost, the Secretary of Defense is chartering this effort. This is not uh, someone lower in the Department of Defense. And he has assigned that task to the Office of Secretary of Defense, uh, the uh, Undersecretary for Intelligence and Security, that's me, because I'm responsible for looking at intelligence matters, I'm responsible for security matters. This is potentially both. 
So when you start um, concerning the, um, the, ourselves with the safety of our personnel, the, the safety of our installations and bases, there's no other higher priority than, than what we have than actually getting after this. And, and as you have stated, we have been uh, assigned that task to actually stand up an office, the AIM SOG, which I believe the name, sir, will likely change. But we have moved forward in terms of moving to establish that office. We have, uh, as of this week, uh, picked the director for that effort, a uh, very established and um, and uh, accomplished individual. We've identified spaces. We've uh, worked with personnel across the Department of Defense with the services, and we've worked with the IC, which is on board in helping us work through this standardized methodology for now, bringing in data, analyzing that data, and reporting that data in the appropriate method and appropriate means so we can either get it to our service personnel to ensure their safety or get it to you and the Congress and to the public to ensure that you have oversight to what we're doing. So chartered by the Secretary of Defense, standardized and uh, uh, really a methodical approach is something that we're doing that has not been done before. Can we get some kinds of assurances that uh, your analysts will follow the facts where they lead and, and assess all hypotheses? Absolutely. So we're open to all hypotheses. We're open to any uh, conclusions that, uh, that we may encounter. Uh, quickly before I pass it to the ranking member uh, and, and Chairman Schiff, uh, I want to thank you both for taking the time, and, and I had a good time meeting with you last week, uh, Director Moultrie, Undersecretary uh, Moultrie. Um, it's fair to say that you are a science fiction fan, is that correct? It is fair to say that uh, I am an inquisitive mind who has uh, spent 40 years in the intelligence field and has focused on both science and science fiction. That is fair. Could you tell us about it? Yeah, well, yeah, look, my generation grew up uh, looking at uh, space sagas and, and the, the Apollo program. So all of us who uh, grew up in the 60s uh, were, were just thrilled by watching um, our first astronaut land on the moon. That was a momentous occasion to people who were of different generations. Uh, some of them didn't believe that it happened. I still have relatives and friends who don't believe it happened, right? Science fiction to them. But to us, it was, no, that's the progress that we've made. And so I was enthralled by that, and I've taken that to heart. I enjoy um, uh, the challenge of what may be out there. I have mentioned to you that, uh, yes, I have followed science fiction. I have gone to conventions, even. I'll say it on the record. Uh, uh, Got to break the ice somehow. But, uh, you know, I, I have done that, right? But there's nothing wrong with that. Um, don't necessarily dress up, but I do, uh, you know, I do believe that it's important to show that the Department of Defense has, um, you know, we have character. And we're people just like you, just like the American people. We have our, um, we have our, um, our inquisitiveness. Uh, we have our questions. We want to know what's out there as much as you want to know what's out there. We get the questions not just from you, we get it from family members. And we get them night and day, uh, not just in committee hearings. So finding what's out there is important. But first and for uh, foremost, it's important for us to do that so that we can ensure that our people, our personnel, our aviators, our bases and installations are safe. Um, and then that curiosity factor is something else that, uh, that we just want to know because that's the human race. It's just, you know, that insatiable desire to know. Thank you, sir. Ranking Member Crawford. Mr. Walter, you said you don't necessarily dress up. <laughs> uh, that wasn't a real strong statement. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you for being here today. We appreciate it. Um, and thank you, Mr. Walter, for breaking the ice the way you did. Appreciate that. Uh, the inability to understand objects in our sensitive operating areas is tantamount to an intelligence failure that we certainly want to avoid. This is not about finding alien spacecraft, but about delivering dominant intelligence across the tactical, operational, and strategic spectrum. So my question is, how can AIM-SOG lead to prevention of intelligence surprises? Sure, I'll start with that. Uh, so the goal of our effort is to integrate it into what we already do on a normal basis, which is look for the unknown unknowns Congressman, as you stated in your opening remarks, across all domains. So we've been doing this for decades. We've been looking at the space domain, looking at space objects, looking at space weather, looking at space phenomenon. Uh, 
uh, we've been looking at things in the air domain. And we, as you know, we, um, and I'll talk more about this in classified session, but we have a very concerted effort to understand adversarial platforms and adversarial developmental programs. And we do that also in the ground domain. And of course, we're very interested in what happens in the, uh, in the underwater or sea domain, if you will, subsurface domain. So if there are objects that our uh, aviators or air crews are encountering in this air domain and their sensors are, um, are discovering or detecting some of these objects, we want to just bring that in to the normal process that we have for identifying unknown unknowns. We want to make sure we have the intelligence requirements that allow us not only to look at that event from the time that it occurs forward, but maybe retrospectively, we want to go back and see if we can get to the left of that event to say, was there some developmental program that we, to get to your technical surprise uh, issue, sir, that we should have known about? And if so, how do we put that uh, intelligence requirement in place to ensure that we are following an adversarial development or any other development that may be out there. So that's what we we want to do in terms of normalizing this and bringing it into the normal process of how we identify unknown unknowns. So you mentioned fidelity, and I, and I think it's important to talk about the relationship from the Navy as the lead agency on this. Uh, how do you interact with um, Space Force, Air Force, to create that degree of fidelity? We're talking about sensors and so on, and I guess where I have some concerns that many of the images that we see commonly um, in this committee and even in open source, the resolution and the clarity um, that would allow a, a robust technical intelligence analysis is challenging. So is AIMSOG uh, prepared to address the quality and, and quantity of data collected on UAP to advance intelligence collection? And do you have the adequate sensors you need to collect that high quality data? One of the lines of effort that we have is looking at our sensor capabilities and to understand whether or not, as the video showed that Mr. Bray um, displayed, uh, sometimes it's very fleeting uh, data that we have on some of these objects. And, and, and we want to make sure that, one, uh, our systems are calibrated. Uh, to actually be able to collect on the objects. You know, our sensors today are they're calibrated for specific things. We want to make sure to calibrate it for things of this nature, things of this size, things of this velocity, if I can use that term. We want to make sure that once we have that, that that data is stored in some standardized method uh, that we can then extract and that we can feed into our system real time. So we do not like want this to take some uh, prolonged period of time for us to get that data. But our goal is absolutely to have that high fidelity information that we get from all sensors. And we want to be able to integrate that with what we may have off of ground-based sensors. So whatever you may have on a platform, whatever you may have on the ground, whatever we may have from um, other sensors that we may have in different domains, we want to be able to integrate that all and get this integrated picture as we would, as I said, with any other unidentified objects or things that we are tracking um, as a part of our normal intelligence responsibilities. Thank you. Last question, Mr. Bray. If you would, uh, I'm a Navy pilot. I've um, encountered a UAP. Walk me through the reporting protocol um, once I see something that I, th I think needs reported. Uh, <clears throat> the first thing that that uh, aviator would do uh, after landing as a part of uh, their normal uh, debriefing is they would uh, uh, contact their uh, intelligence officer. Their intelligence officer would then uh, walk them through uh, first filing a, um, first actually, data preservation to in, to ensure that uh, that whatever sensor data uh, may be on the aircraft that we preserve that um, so that it's available for for later analysis um, second they would actually fill out a a, a form uh, that uh, that includes details like where they were operating altitudes they were operating speeds what they observed uh, whatever sensor data sensor data they uh, may have recorded from that uh, and then that report uh, is filed it goes two places one it goes through um, through the operational uh, chain of command, so that operational units are aware of what uh, what's being observed, and also th uh, to the UAP task force, so that they can take that data, uh, database it, uh, and uh, quite often uh, have individuals from the task force uh, contact the aviator uh, and ask them additional questions if there were things that weren't clear uh, in the uh, in the report. Uh, that then goes into a um, uh, into a, a database uh, where we begin to compare it with other um, observations that we have. Again, comparing for locations, comparing for altitude, speeds, shapes. Uh, if any RF emissions were detected from the platform, uh, all of that, so that we can try to reach some conclusions on that. 
Thank you. Yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chairman Schiff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Bright, can you rerun that first uh, image that looked like it was outside of a plane window? Um, and if you wouldn't mind going up to the screen and tell us what we're, what we're seeing. Uh, I, not that you can necessarily tell us what we're seeing, but right. explain what we should be looking at in that first image. Absolutely. Uh, and Alexi, what I'll ask is if you can stop it at a certain point. And are we looking outside of a uh, civilian aircraft window? Is that what we're looking at? Okay. Is that it right there? Uh, can you point to the screen again what we're supposed to be looking at? Okay, if you could stop that frame. That's not the one. No, that's not the one. object right here it zooms by the window uh, right in this area right there. There we go. Could you see that part right there again going by? I think we're having a hard time stopping it in the right spot. Okay. So as you can see, it's difficult. To, and I think a part of the issue here is uh, um, the laptop we're working with uh, is yeah. not as easy for uh, stopping that video we'll, in the right we'll, spot. We'll describe what, what we have seen in that. Uh, what are we observing? Uh, what you see here uh, is um, uh, aircraft that is uh, operating in a, uh, uh, in a U.S. Navy uh, training range uh, that has observed uh, spherical objects. Uh, in that area, uh, and as they fly by it, they take a video. You see, a, um, it looks uh, reflective in this video, somewhat reflective, uh, and it quickly passes by uh, the cockpit of the, uh, of the aircraft. And is this one of the phenomena that we can't explain? I do not have an explanation for what this, this specific uh, uh, object is. And, and is this one of the situations where it is, that's the, that's the object that we're looking at right there? 
Thank you. Um, and is this a situation where it was observed by the pilot and it was also recorded by the aircraft's instruments? Uh, we'll talk about the multi-sensor part uh, in a later session. Uh, but in this case, uh, we have at least that. Um, in, in the Director of National Intelligence uh, 2021 unclassified report, um, the ODNI reported 144 UAPs between 2004 and 2021, 80% uh, of which were uh, recorded on multiple instruments. Um, and I take it with respect to some of those, you had the pilot, a pilot seeing them if it was observed by a pilot, right. and you had multiple instruments recording it. So you really have three sensors, the human sensor and two uh, technical uh, sensors detecting the object, is that? For the, for the majority of uh, uh, incidents that we had in the uh, uh, last year's report, uh, the majority had multi-sensor data. Uh, when I talk about the 400 reports that we have now, uh, I, that number will certainly go down because a lot of those uh, new reports that we have are actually historic reports that are narrative-based. So that percentage will go down just as a uh, factor of uh, the fact that the, that the destigmatization has resulted in more narrative reports. And, and that's the object we're looking at right there now, right? That's it right there. Okay. Um, last year's report also said that of those 144, 18 of them uh, reportedly appeared to exhibit unusual flight characteristics, appear to demonstrate advanced technology, uh, and some of them appeared to remain stationary in winds aloft, move against the wind, maneuver abruptly, or move at considerable speed without discernible means of propulsion. Um, that's pretty intriguing. Uh, uh, and, and if you're able to answer this uh, in this setting, are we aware of any uh, foreign adversary capable of moving objects uh, without any discernible means of propulsion? Um, I think I would, uh, without discernible means of propulsion, I would say that uh, we're not aware of any adversary that can move an object without discernible means of propulsion. Uh, the question then becomes, in many of these cases where we don't have a discernible mean of propulsion in the data that we have, um, in some cases uh, um, there is likely sensor artifacts uh, that, uh, that, that may be hiding some of that. Uh, there's certainly some degree of uh, of something that looks like signature management that we have seen from some of these uh, uh, UAP, uh, but I would I would caution I would simply say that there are a number of uh, of events in which we do not have an explanation in which the, and there are a small handful in which there are flight characteristics or signature management um, that we can't explain with the data that we have. Um, we'll continue. Those are obviously the ones that are of most interest to us. Uh, earlier, when we asked about how you uh, avoid technological surprise, the biggest way you avoid technological surprise is by collecting this type of data and by importantly um, calibrating the assumptions that you go into with how you do that analysis. I'll tell you, within the UAP task force, we have uh, one basic assumption, and that is that generally speaking, generally speaking, our sensors operate as designed. Um, and we make that assumption because many times these are multi-sensor uh, collections. We make no assumptions about uh, the origin of this uh, or that there may or may not be some sort of technology that we don't understand. That's, I think, the key to avoiding technological surprises by calibrating those assumptions. And finally, um, with respect to the second two videos uh, showing the small triangles, um, the hypothesis is that those are uh, commercial drones that, uh, because of the use of night vision goggles appear like triangles? Is that the operating assessment? Some type of, uh, of drone, uh, some type of, uh, of unmanned aerial system, uh, and it is simply that that light source uh, resolves itself through the, um, uh, through the night vision goggles onto the SLR camera as a triangle. And have we, in order to prove that hypothesis, uh, flown a drone uh, and observed it with that same technology to see whether we can reprodu reproduce the effect? The UAP task force is aware of studies that have done that. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Dr. Winstrup. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here. Um, 
My first question is, uh, through this process where there's been sightings, have the sightings been stationary or have they always been sighted from a moving object, from a plane or a ship that may be moving? Have these reports ever come from a stationary object being observed in the sky? The UAP Task Force does have uh, reports from stationary, uh, from state reports from a stationary observer. Okay. There's a difference observing something when you're moving as right. well. It's, it's physics, right? That's right. why I asked that question. Uh, are we capable or have we made any breakthroughs or anyone made any breakthroughs to be able to cite something and make some determination at all of its composition, whether it's a solid or a gas? Uh, do, is there any such uh, capability? Um, from I'm not asking what, I'm just... Right. From, from some of the returns, I mean, it, it's clear that, uh, that the majority, well, it's clear that many of the observations we have are physical objects uh, from the, the sensor data that we have. Phys well, gas is, physical, is a physical object. It can be. And so and you, you see where I'm going right. with this. I'm trying to determine what it is we're looking at. So if we right. can decide if something is a solid or a gas, and, and, and if there have been any conclusion on its capabilities, like its capabilities of, of movement, uh, of turning, uh, going, you know, 180 degrees or 90 degree turn, anything along that line that we've been able to determine. Um, within the, uh, and again, I should point out that, uh, you know, that there is not a single explanation for UAP. They are, make up, there are a lot of different things uh, that, that are unidentified right, aerial so phenomena. Basically, it's, but, we really don't know much on that. That's, that's all I'm trying to get at. We, and I'm pleased that you have protocol right now for our, our military, but are there any non-military reports coming forward of similar events, or is it all coming from military? Uh, the UAP Task Force has a very good working relationship uh, with the FAA. Uh, they have very good working relationship with other parts uh, of the U.S. government so that we can ingest reports uh, from um, uh, Do we have from, from any reports non-military? Yes. Thank you. That's, that's, that's my question. Um, and do we need to put out protocol for civilians that may be in that arena, like through FAA? Do you think that would be appropriate and helpful? I think standardized the reporting, without a doubt, is key to helping us get to the to ascertain what some of these are. I think it would be important as well. Do we? Um, there are other people besides uh, the U.S. that have had these experiences and reported them. Is that correct? There are. That's correct. Uh, is it uh, all of our allies, or is it allies and adversaries? What have we learned publicly? So some of that, I think, sir, we'll save for closed session. Well, that goes to my next question. Publicly, have others sit, made anything which would not have to be considered closed? So, I don't want you to answer what they've said, necessarily. A allies well, have, uh, have seen these. China has established its own version of a UAP task force. So uh, clearly a number of countries have observations of, uh, uh, of things in the airspace that they can't identify. And uh, do we share data with some, with all? Are they sharing with us? We share data with some and some share data with us. But not necessarily all that have publicly reported something? That's correct. OK. Um, and I think that's an, an important thing, and for the other session, actually, that we, we don't discuss mm -hmm. that now. Um, because, you know, obviously something like this can be uh, a national security challenge for us, and no doubt about it. If they're developed by an adversary um, through some breakthrough technology, they can be very disruptive to our military actions, uh, or at least serve as a destruction. So my caution would be, uh, be careful who we share our data with and don't necessarily trust some of the data we may get from someone else. And with that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back, Mr. Himes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> One of the objectives of this open hearing is to um, try to erode some of the stigma that attaches to, in particular, our military men and women reporting this. It's obviously really very serious because uh, should one of our adversaries have developed a technology that we don't know about it, we need to know about it yesterday. And, and obviously, uh, any sort of stigma that prevents our, our uh, military 
from reporting this data as comprehensively as possible as a national security threat. So uh, I really just have two questions in the service of that goal. Uh, the first is, um, the chairman asked that we run that video again. Most people, when they see a video, we're, we're all used to watch, seeing things from a car, seeing things from a sidewalk. Very few people have the experience of observing something through night vision goggles at Mach 1.5. So just talk for a minute about, if you would, uh, whichever is, of you is most appropriate, how radically different observation is at high speed and three dimension than it is for most of us who walk around and drive cars. Um, so the, the first uh, thing I think that's important to, to note about this is there are lots of things when you are moving very fast and an object is between you and a stationary reference point like the ground, uh, it gives a lot of different impressions about how quickly uh, something is or isn't moving. And it actually um, means that it is a challenge, uh, especially with narrative-based uh, data, uh, to get a lot of information on that. That's why the sensor data is so important, because things do happen very quickly, uh, as you see there. Um, and sometimes things that happen very quickly, something may be moving very slow. That aircraft is moving quite fast. How fast that object is moving that goes by is probably very slow. So I guess, I guess my point is that an observation, either a visual observation or a uh, uh, a uh, electronic observation, infrared or whatever, uh, looks radically different uh, than it does to most people. Um, even instruments, uh, instruments are on gimbals and that sort of thing, so that creates a very unusual uh, view to, again, those of us who are used to seeing things on in two dimensions largely. And, um, second question, um, I think, Mr. Bray, you said something that I want to unpack a little bit. Uh, uh, a number of these UAPs, you said, we can't explain. Again, in the service of sort of reducing uh, speculation and conspiracy theories, we can't explain can range from a visual observation that was distant on a foggy night, we don't know what it is, to we've found an organic material that we can't identify, right? Those are radically different world, worlds. So when you say we can't explain, give the public a little bit better sense of where on that spectrum of we can't explain we are. Are we holding materials, organic or inorganic, that we don't know about? Are we you know, picking up emanations that are something other than light or infrared that could be deemed to be communications. Give us a sense for what you mean when you say we can't explain. Sure. Uh, when I say uh, we can't explain, I, I mean exactly as you described there, that there is a lot of information uh, like the video that we showed in which there's simply too little data uh, to to create a reasonable explanation. There are a small handful of cases in which we have more data um, that our analysis simply hasn't been able to uh, uh, to fully pull together a picture uh, of what happened. Um, the um, uh, And those are the cases where we talk about where we see some indications of flight characteristics or signature management uh, that are not what we had expected. Uh, when it comes to material that we have, we have no material. Uh, we have detected no emanations uh, within the UAP task force that that is uh, that would suggest it's anything non-terrestrial uh, in origin. So there's um, when I say unexplained, I mean everything from too little too little data uh, to we simply the data that we have doesn't point us towards an explanation. Uh, but we'll go wherever the data takes us. Again, we've made no assumptions about what this is or isn't. Uh, we're committed to understanding these, and so we'll go wherever that data takes us. Thank thank you. That's that's very helpful. And so it, I think it bears emphasis when you say we can't explain everything that you can't explain is in a bucket called data. Is that correct? And that would mean uh, data collected by sensors, visual observations, everything that we can't explain, quote unquote, is in a bucket called data. Right. A narrative report uh, from uh, from the early 2000s, if it just had a little bit of information on it, would be in our database and it would be unresolved. I, I would add to that it's insufficient data. I mean, that's one of the challenges we have. Insufficient data either on the event itself, the object itself, or insufficient data or plug-in with some other organization or agency that may have had something in that space at that time. So it, it's a data issue that we're, that we're facing in many of these instances, Congressman. Understood. Thank you very much. Yield back. Gentleman yields back. Mr. Gallagher. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for allowing me to join this hearing. Um, I really appreciate uh, the witness's testimony. Um, Mr. Moultrie, as the chairman uh, mentioned, uh, DOD had an initiative to study UFOs in the 1960s called Project Blue Book. It's also been well reported in our briefing and in, in other places that we have more, have more recent projects, specifically uh, ATIP. Could you describe any other initiatives that the DOD or DOD contractors have managed after Project Blue Book ended and prior to ATIP beginning? Did anything also predate Project Blue Book? So I, I, I can't speak to what may have predated uh, Project Blue Book. I mean, of course, there's Roswell and all these other things that people have talked about over the years. Um, I'm familiar with Blue Book. I'm familiar with, uh, with ATIP. Uh, I haven't seen other documented. Uh, studies that have been done by DOD in that regard. So you're not aware of anything in between Project Blue Book and ATIP? I'm not aware of anything that's uh, official that was done in between those two. Okay. Hasn't been uh, brought to my attention. Okay. Uh, additionally, are you aware of any other DOD or DOD contract programs focused on UAPs from a technological engineering perspective? And by that I mean, are you aware of any technology initiatives focused on this topic other than initiatives focused on the individual case inve investigations? I am not aware of any contractual programs that are focused on uh, any anything related to this other than what we are doing in the Navy task force and what we are about to launch in terms of our effort. Uh, same question for you, Mr. Bray. Uh, same answer, not aware of anything outside what we uh, are doing in the UAP task force. So just to confirm, you're not aware of any technology or engineering resources that have been focused on these efforts besides what we've mentioned today? Once again, I'll say no contractual uh, uh, or uh, programmatic uh, efforts that are involved. The reason why I, I, I Qualify that way. Yeah, let me qualify it that way. I, I can't speak to what people may be looking at in the department. Somebody says, I'm looking at something, I'm looking at something that may Got be it. unidentified, and I, I can't speak to that. I speak to official programs that we have on the record. It's also been reported uh, that there have been UAP observed uh, and interacting with and flying over sensitive military facilities, particularly, and not just ranges, but uh, some facilities housing our strategic nuclear forces. Uh, one such incident allegedly occurred uh, uh, at Malmstrom Air Force Base, in which 10 of our nuclear ICBMs were rendered inoperable at the same time. A glowing red orb was observed overhead. I'm not commenting on the accuracy of this. I'm simply asking you whether you're aware of it and whether you have any comment on the accuracy of that report. Let me pass that to Mr. Bray. If you've been looking at UAPs over the last uh, three years. Uh, that data is not uh, within the holdings of the UAP task force. Okay. But are you aware of the, the report or that the data exists somewhere? I have uh, I have heard stories. I have not seen the official data on that. So you've just seen informal stories, no official assessment that you've done or exists within DOD that you're aware of uh, regarding the Malmstrom incident. Uh, all I can speak to is you know what's within my cognizance, of the UAP task force, and we have not looked at that incident. Well, I would say I mean it's a pretty high profile incident. Uh, I, I don't claim to be an expert on this, but that's out there in the ether. You're, you're the guys investigating it. I mean, if, who else is doing it? If something was officially brought to our attention, we would look at it. Uh, there are many things that are out there in the ether that aren't officially brought to our attention. So how would it have to be officially brought to your Excuse attention? I'm bringing it to your attention. Sure, so, <laughs> this is pretty official. Sure. So we'll go back and take a look at it. But generally, there is some um, authoritative figure that says there is an incident that occurred. We'd like you to look at this. Uh, but in terms of just tracking what may be in the media that says that something occurred at this time, at this place, uh, there are probably a, a lot of leads that we would have to follow up on. I don't think we have resources to do that right now. Well, I don't claim to be an authoritative figure, but for what it's worth, I would like you to look in, into it. And sure. If for no other reason, you could dismiss it and say this is not worth wasting resources on. We'll do. Um, and then finally, are, are you aware of a document that appeared around uh, 2019, uh, sometimes called the Admiral Wilson Memo or EW Notes Memo? I am, I am, I am not. You're not. Are you I'm not personally aware of that. Okay. Uh, this is a document in which, again, I'm not commenting on the veracity. Uh, I was hoping you would help me with that, in which a former uh, head of DIA claims mm -hmm. to have had a conversation with the Dr. Eric Wilson uh, and claims to have uh, sort of been made aware of certain um, contractors or, or DOD programs um, that he tried to get uh, fuller access to and was denied uh, access to. Um, so you're not aware of, uh, of that. I'm not aware, Congressman. Uh, in my 10 seconds remaining, then, I, I guess I just would ask Mr. Chairman unanimous consent to enter that memo into the record. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it.
Mr. Krishnamurthy. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to both of you for appearing today and for your public service. First question is, uh, there have been no collisions between any U.S. assets and one of these UAPs, correct? We have not had a collision. We've had at least 11 near misses, though. And uh, maybe we'll talk about those 11 near misses or any place where there's close proximity. Um, I assume, or tell me if I'm wrong, there's been no uh, attempt, there's no communications uh, or any kind of uh, communication signals that emanate from those objects uh, that we've detected, correct? That, that's correct. And have we attempted to communicate with those objects? Uh, no. So we don't we don't even put out a alert saying you know uh, U.S. Um, identify you know identify yourself uh, you are you know within our flight path or something like that. We we haven't said anything like that. We've not put anything out like that. Generally speaking, uh, what. Uh, you know, for example, in the video that we showed earlier, uh, it appears to be something that is, uh, you know, unmanned, uh, appears to be something that uh, may or may not be in controlled flight, uh, and so we've not attempted any communication uh, with that. Okay, so, um, and I, I assume we've never discharged any armaments against a UAP, correct? That's correct. Um, how about wreckage? Ha have we come across any wreckage of any kind of um, object that has now been examined by you? The UAP task force doesn't have any wreckage that isn't uh, explainable, that, that isn't consistent with being of terrestrial origin. Do we have any sensors underwater uh, to um, detect on submerged UAPs? Uh, anything that is in the ocean or in the seas? So I think uh, that would be more appropriately addressed in closed session, sir. Okay. Um, I think one of the biggest questions that uh, that, that I have is um, we say with a lot of probability, we say they, quote unquote, probably do represent physical objects, close quote. Um, when we say probably, is that because we cannot conclusively say that they are physical objects? In the task force uh, uh, report, uh, when when I say probably uh, represent physical objects, uh, most of them represent physical objects. There could be some that are more of a uh, uh, of a uh, you know, meteorological phenomena, something like that, that may not uh, be a physical object in the uh, in the sense that most people think of something you could go up and touch. But the ones where you say most of them uh, represent physical objects, can you say that? they are definitely, like with 100% certainty, that they are physical objects? I can say with certainty that uh, a number of these are physical objects. Okay, so there, we can't rule out that some of them may not be physical objects. So, some uh, certainly could be a sensor anomaly uh, or something like that. Some could be. Now, how about uh, with regard to UAPs? We've talked about UAPs on training areas, uh, but obviously... Um, there's some sensor bias. I would think we, we put sensors in training areas. Um, how about with regard to non-training areas? Do we track what's in open source um, and what civilians and others have tracked? And have we found similarities to uh, what they've observed in terms of UAPs in non-training areas to the ones that are in training areas? Uh, the UAP task force is uh Worked very hard to to make sure the data set that we're working with is a uh, is a data set that we have very good uh, control over that data. Uh, so we have some partnerships with FAA so that we get some of that so we get that reporting in. Um, but if it comes to just you know open source reports or someone says that they saw something that generally does not make it into our database. So we, basically, it sounds like we have a good partnership with FAA, um, but apart from FAA, we don't have partnerships with other agencies or other entities that might be tracking so that we could enlarge our data set to make comparisons. So we will. So that's the goal of this next effort will be to uh, expand that relationship with the, uh, the, the rest of government and the interagency so we can understand what they're seeing, what we're seeing. We can correlate on uh, each other's holdings because and hopefully I think, resolve this. Sorry to interrupt, but I, I think that we're, we might have a bias right now going on with regard to just reporting on UAPs being in training areas when we don't 
really track what's happening elsewhere. Last question, have our encounters with UAPs altered the development of our either our offense or offensive or defensive capabilities or even our sensor capabilities? It, we'd take that for the closed session. Okay, great. Thank you. Mr. LaHood. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank the witnesses for being here today. Uh, obviously, this topic of UAPs uh, has attracted a lot of interest in, in people that are um, curious about uh, this, this hearing today. As we talk about, um, and I would say there's a lot of what I would call uh, amateur interest groups uh, that are involved in the UAP field. My, my question is, when um, there are unsubstantiated claims or manufactured claims of UAPs or kind of false information that's put out there, uh, what are the consequences for people that are involved with that or groups that are involved with that? So one of the concerns that we have is that uh, there are a lot of uh, individuals and groups that are, are putting information out there that, um, that could be considered to be somewhat self-serving. Uh, we're trying to do what's in, the, what's in the best interest of, one, the Department of Defense, and then, two, what's in the best interest of the public to ensure that we can put factual-based information back into the mainstream and back into the bloodstream of the reporting uh, media that we have so people understand what's there. It's important because we are attempting, um, as this hearing has, has drawn out, to understand, one, what may just be natural phenomenon, two, what may be sensor phenomenology or things that were happening with sensors, three, what may be legitimate counterintelligence threats to places that we have or bases or installations or security threats to our platforms. And anything that diverts us off of what we have with the resources that have been allocated to us send us off in these spurious uh, chases and hunts that are just not helpful. And they also help, that, well, they also contribute to the undermining of the confidence that the Congress and the American people have that we are trying to get to the root cause of what's happening here, report on that, and then feed that back into our national security apparatus so we are able to protect the American people and our allies. So it is harmful, it is hurtful, but hopefully if we get more information out there, we'll start to lessen the impact of some of those spurious reports. So, so just taking that a step further, so th th that misinformation, false narratives, manufactured, so what are the consequences? Are there legal consequences? Mm -hmm. Are there examples that you can give us where people have been held accountable by this misinformation or disinformation? I, I can't give you, you know, any examples where somebody's been legally held liable for putting something out there. But Well, I uh, guess what's the deterrent from people engaging yeah. in this activity? I don't. I don't know. I. I don't have that answer. I, that's something that uh, you know. Welcome the dialogue with, with Congress to talk about that with the members who uh, you know help legislate those laws to say what should be the uh, the legal ramifications that we could use to potentially hold individuals accountable, whether it be um, citizens or information that might be injected into um, our media by other uh, other forces or other countries, if you will. And in terms of DODs and uh, you know review and analysis in this field, I mean, is there is there a standard in place when it comes to UAPs? I mean, is there any guidance you look to that's codified in law or otherwise within DOD that that kind of sets out the standards for UAPs and and what to look for? I think that's part of what the the, the group that we're uh, standing up now will be um, charted to do. We're actually, for my organization, will be looking at policy and standards that we have uh, to. Um, come to you and work with you to actually put in place and uh, promulgate across our government. Thank you. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Mr. Welch. Uh, thank you. I'm going to follow on the, the line of questions from Mr. LaHood. Uh, gentlemen, what seems incredibly difficult for you is that there's two almost competing but different uh, narratives. One is uh, it's uh, the no one knows whether there's extraterrestrial life. It's a big universe, and it would be uh, pretty presumptuous to have a hard and fast conclusion. And then if there is, uh, it's not beyond the realm of possibility that there is some exploration coming here. Uh, and that underlies a lot of the reports you get. I think Mr. LaHood was asking about that. People think there must be extraterrestrial life, and it's not at all 
uh, beyond the pale that uh, there would be a visit here. On the other hand, you, as the DOD, you have the responsibility to make sure uh, that our national security is protected and that if there are surveillance drones or uh, active drones that can disable our systems, uh, that has to be analyzed, has to be stopped. So how do you divide the, the, the how do you separate your responsibilities where uh, you get all these reports uh, from folks who uh, may be in good faith, maybe not, uh, believe that you should be investigating every possible uh, uh, report of a um, extraterrestrial incident. I'll start with you, Mr. Moultrie. Sure, indeed, Congressman, and, and, and thank you for the question. Um, it, it's important that we, um, as a part of this effort, uh, really uh, build out the relationship that we have with others, including NASA, and, and for the reasons that you just pointed out. So there are elements in our government that are engaged in uh, looking for life in other places, and they have been doing that for decades. Right? So they've been searching for extraterrestrial life. Uh, there are astrobiologists who have been doing this too. We're a part of that same government, and so our goal is not to um, potentially cover up something if we were to find something. It's to understand what may be out there, um, examine what... Um, what it may mean for us, if there are any, from a defense perspective, any national security implications or ramifications, but then to work with organizations as appropriate, if it's a weather phenomenology with NOAA, if it's uh, an, a, a potential for extraterrestrial life or an indication of extraterrestrial life with someone like NASA. So the, trans that. the transparency actually is very important Completely. for public uh, consumption. Completely. But we're going to have a classified briefing, and without going into the details uh, of what kinds of secrets uh, that we can't share here, uh, what is it? What are we protecting? I don't know if you can answer this question uh, in this open forum, but in fact, uh, your perception of what it is we have to quote. Protect. So I think right now what's really important for us to protect is uh, how we know certain things. So there are a lot of things that we know, whether it be about um, uh, the thinking of other leaders around the world, the weapon systems that are being developed, or how we detect things that may be threats to us. Many of those things are um, the result of some of our most sensitive sources and methods. And we'll use those things, not just for this effort, but those same sources and methods are used to help protect us from adversaries and from others who might mean to do us harm. There aren't separate uh, UAP sensors. There's not a, a separate UAP processing computer. There's not a separate UAP dissemination chain or whatever. So it's the same processes. It's the same system that we have that, that helps us do all that. We need to protect that because the, um, this is something that uh, that we're looking at, but we're sure there are going to be other things that we'll look at in the future that we'll need those same sensors, we'll, we'll need those same sources and methods to help us do. So we're protecting the fact of the, the that this nation has developed capabilities that enable us to know what may be threats to us and to counter those threats before they uh, become something of a, uh, a national issue. Uh, thank you very much. I want to thank both uh, you, Mr. Bray, and you, Mr. Moultrie, for your appearance today. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. <clears throat> Gentlemen, beyond videos, <clears throat> is there a range of other information um, that the executive branch has that would be valuable to the American people uh, while protecting sources and methods, obviously? Um, the details of individual encounters, uh, including the time, place, and details of an encounter? And does the AIMSOG have a clear and repeatable process um, for considering public release? Uh, as part of the process. Chairman Carson, the... Um, uh, and do you commit to building that process if it's not in place? Uh, the UAP Task Force, uh, you know, the, the security classification guide uh, that, uh, that the UAP Task Force has been operating under uh, that I approved um, really was meant to protect those sources and methods and meant to protect um, uh, any knowledge uh, that an adversary intelligence uh, uh, entity may gain from, under, from understanding what we're tracking, how we track it, or... Um, when we're tracking it or if we're not. Um, and so that has been an important piece uh, in the balance between transparency uh, and preserving our warfighting advantage because the U.S. military does train as it would fight. Um, what I uh, will commit to uh, is at least for that material that's under my authority, 
um, as the Deputy Director of Naval Intelligence um, for uh, information that we have when it does not involve sources and methods uh, or and when we can, with a reasonable uh, degree of confidence, determine that it does not pose a foreign intelligence or national security threat, uh, and it's within my authority to do so, I commit to declassifying that. So I, I believe very much in the transparency of this, uh, and we work very hard to balance that uh, with our national security needs. And I'll just add, Congressman, um, just over the last three, four months, I think that the, um, the intelligence community and the national defense apparatus have disclosed more information on various events than it has in, in, in uh, probably see the, the previous 10 years. Um, you have our commitment to work closely with the Director of National Intelligence and uh, others in the uh, declassification and downgrading of intel uh, apparatus to ensure that we can get whatever information that we can out to the American people and to the public writ large. Greatly appreciated, sir. Ranking Member Crawford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Representative Stefanik is en route, I believe, just real quickly, but in the interim, if I could, if you'll indulge me, I just have one, uh, a couple of real small questions. One is, uh, do we have an example? Can you cite a, sp a specific example of an object that can't be explained as having been human-made or natural? I, I mean, the... the um the example that, that that I would say that, we, that is still unresolved, uh, that I think everyone understands quite well, is the 2004 uh, incident from from Nimitz. Uh, we have data on that, uh, and it simply remains unresolved. Uh, does not mean it resolves to being something right that is easily explainable or uh, difficulty. Or well, obviously it resolves to being something that is difficult to explain. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I can't point to something that definitively was not. Uh, man-made, but I can point to a number of examples in which remain unresolved. Gotcha. Uh, with regard to videos that have appeared in open source channels, for example, the Tic Tac video, does AIMSOG maintain control of videos and how do you prevent leaks of potentially classified videos or other material? So the AIMSOG, as we um, establish that organization, we will have a uh, a process for classified and compartmented holdings, and we will find a way of getting positive control over those. So we have uh, our sensitive access programs and special access programs that allow us to put what we call SAPs around things, and then there's uh, controlled access programs that allow us to put caps around things. So we'll have that uh, in place. Uh, our goal will be um, ensuring that we're sharing that with the appropriate analysts and the appropriate exploiters, if you will, who can look at that data too. What we don't want to do is bring something into a DOD database or a DOD holding and then uh, have so many wrappers around it, it's not available to those who really need to look at it and to exploit it. And that's one of the reasons we're establishing relationships with the interagency, with the IC and others to be able to do that, sir. But we will do our best to maintain positive control over the materials that we have within our holdings. Thank you. Chairman Schiff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just going back to the 2021 report, um, you know, under the category of UAP appear to demonstrate advanced technology, uh, those 18 uh, incidents uh, in which uh, some of the UAP appear to remain stationary, winds aloft, move against the wind, maneuver abruptly, or move at considerable speed without discernible means of propulsion. Uh, it goes on to say, in a small number of cases, military aircraft systems processed radio frequency energy associated with UAP sightings. Um, I couldn't tell from that whether that small number of cases was a part of the subset of 18. That is, uh, among the 18, which appeared to move uh, with unusual pattern or flight characteristics, did some of those um, uh, also uh, emit radio frequency energy? I would have to check with our UAP task force on that. I, uh, I believe, without getting into specifics that we can do in the in the closed session, uh, at least some that we have detected uh, RF uh, emissions from were not uh, uh, behaving uh, oddly otherwise. Uh, and and the significance of uh, measuring that radio frequency energy is what, that uh, we suspect that this was a, some form of aircraft in which there were radio transmissions? The biggest thing uh, that you're looking for there is any indication of, uh, of an effort to jam uh, whatever sensors that we may have looking at it. 
But I would also also add to that that um, radio frequency, as you know, Congressman is used to control uh, various platforms too. So the fact of uh, emanations coming off of any platform, whether it be a UAV or, or another platform, could be uh, radio frequency activity related to that entity transmitting out or something transmitting to that platform. And of course, we have a sensitivity with our airborne platforms of picking it up, which is one of the reasons that we uh, try to prevent people from using their cell phones on airplanes and things like that. It's very sensitive to RF emanations. So that's a part of what we'll be looking at in the AIMS log. What is this? Is this something that we can collect on? And can we start to characterize the signaling environment around the emanations that may be coming off of some of these UAPs? So that, that energy then um, that was recorded could be either uh, an effort to jam or it could be an effort to control a UAV um, uh, or uh, any other communication with that uh, craft. I would say that's accurate. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, at, as the ODNI report makes clear, one possible explanation for UAPs is that we are detecting U.S. aircraft, either secret air programs or even test prototypes. I won't ask you in this setting, obviously, uh, to describe any secret DOD programs. That said, I do want to make sure the U.S. government isn't chasing its own tail. Um, Firstly, do you have a clear and repeatable process to check with compartmented programs about whether a UAP sighting is attributable to a U.S. aircraft? Uh, secondly, do, uh, does the AIMSOG staff have the clearances and read-ons that they need to investigate all of these incidents? And, 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 and thirdly, when your staff cannot be read on, uh, are your questions to those who are read on even being answered? So I'll start, and then uh, I'll, I'll pass that to uh, to Mr. Bray. So we're very conscious of the potential blue-on-blue blue issue or U.S.-on-U.S., US. and so we've established relationships with organizations and entities that, um, that are uh, potentially uh, flying or developing platforms for their own interests, if you will. And our goal is to continue, and we have a repeatable process. I think we've had that process for some time to deconflict uh, activities that we may have to ensure that we are not potentially reporting on something that may be a developmental platform or a U.S. operational platform that is performing uh, either testing or performing a mission. So we will have that uh, in place. We've already had those discussions with organizations and entities. We want to uh, ensure that we're protecting their equities. We want to ensure that we're protecting their sources and methods while also getting at what we have here. We want to be able to deconflict those. Absolutely. The UAP task force has uh, uh, had a, a process in place to work uh, with other elements of the Department of Defense and other elements of the government to ensure that uh, that, that there is an uh, as simple a way as possible to deconflict those. And when we reference that in the uh, in the report, uh, I should say that we were um, simply accounting for the fact that there could possibly be one or two uh, data points that had uh, that had leaked through, but we were quite confident that was not the explanation. Um, how 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 are you all liaisoning with um, Space Command? Specifically, how are you partnering with the parts of the U.S. Space Co Command responsible for space domain awareness? And how, if at all, are you partnering with the Space Force to analyze UAPs? Uh, the UAP Task Force uh, has... Um, uh, has a very good uh, relationship uh, with Space Force as it does with the rest of the Department of Defense. Uh, we have uh, pulled analysts in from Space Force to ensure that uh, uh, that we're availing ourselves of that expertise, uh, as well as um, uh, any um, uh, any other material they may have that would be helpful. And uh, Congressman, as you know, um, uh, Space Force and Space Command, they, they have responsibility for space domain awareness. So what we've done, we coordinated with, uh, with Space Force, we coordinated with their J2, and um, she is on board in terms of helping us plug into uh, what they have and for us to have this interactive exchange of information and data. And we're doing that with all the services, so not just with Space Force or Space Command. Thank you, sir. Ranking member, any additional questions? All right, Chairman Schiff. 
All right. Uh, with that, I want to thank you all for, for taking the time out. I also want to thank uh, my colleagues on both sides of the aisle for participating in this very uh, historical and important um, hearing. I think it's one of the few times we can demonstrate some degree of bipartisanship around UAPs and UFOs. So I love it. Appreciate it. Thank you. And we will see you all. We will recess this hearing for the moment and return in a closed session at noon.